All right. Morning. Great to see everybody. Hey, I cannot think of a better way to bring in a new year than to spend some time with a remarkable Air Force family. And Mrs. Walsh, welcome back to Randolph. Thank you so much for your unyielding support of airmen and families over the years. We're happy to have you back, and I hope you enjoy the day. And I know nobody's here to hear me talk. So uh, on behalf of Lieutenant General Quast, it is my distinct honor this morning to introduce the inaugural AETC talk speaker, the Dean of the Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas A&M University, the former Vice Commander of Air Education and Training Command. I mean, that's kind of a big deal, right? <laughs> and the 20th Chief of Staff of the world's greatest Air Force. Ladies and gentlemen, General Mark Welsh. Thanks, everybody. Sit down, please. How you been? Thank you. You should save the applause. I might suck. <laughs> <laughs> then where would you be? <laughs> yeah. Hey, thank you so much for being here this morning. More importantly, thanks for letting me be here. Did you get a chance to meet Betty? Betty, stand up and please stand up. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> My wife rocks. Um, she's here to grade me. This is really kind of intimidating. Uh, she does this occasionally now, and I'll get critiqued later in the car on the way home. I'm, I'm just kidding. It's wonderful to have her come with me. We're actually going up to see my mom. My mom is starting to slip a little bit, and we're looking at memory care places. And so Betty's here to help me with that because I get emotional and I panic about everything, and she's, she's my calming influence. I also had a chance a minute ago to see Chief Master Sergeant Donna Vargas from AATCIG for the... For the entire time I was Chief of Staff, rather than a few days at the beginning, Donna was the rock in the front office, uh, the Chief's front office at the Air Staff. For those of you who don't know her, get a, get a chance to visit with her sometime. Uh, she's a single mom, she takes care of her mother, while she's getting her daughter through high school, she was managing everything in that building, all the nonsense that goes on in the Pentagon, and all those waves would crash into our front office and hit Donna and just go away, because she didn't react, she just got the job done. Um, she was a sounding board, she was a confidant, she was an advisor, she was just a wonderful, wonderful professional. And Donna, it is so good to see you, and even better to see you with Chief Stripes on your arm. Congratulations, Chief. Yeah. And it's a thrill to be here. Everybody starts in this command, you know, I, there's, there's something about that in the motto. But it, every, the great part about coming back to Randolph is it's kind of timeless. The Taj doesn't seem to change which is a good thing. It's a foundation for things in our Air Force, and that's what I love about being here. And there's so many of you in this audience who've been here for a long time, making sure it remained the foundation. Thank you for that. Thanks for what you've built over time. I hope you're as proud of it as I am, looking at it from the other side. Uh, Mitch and the gang asked me to come this morning and talk about a couple of things. And uh, the first one was, let's talk a little bit about why you were successful, which really requires like one really big assumption. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure I've been successful yet. I did my first semester as dean of the Bush School win the Armadilla Cup, which is a softball competition between the LBJ School in Austin and the Bush School at College Station, and uh, we took that baby home. I dominated the trophy ceremony. <laughs> that guy gives me no lip anymore. But when I started thinking about how do I talk about what made me successful, Betty and I had a great conversation about this, and we ultimately decided that I should start by talking about the thing that probably has helped me more than anything else, and that's my incredible IT skills. <laughs> <laughs> we, we got started laughing about this because we both thought of exactly the same thing. Uh, I had just gotten a new phone here, which kind of got us into this conversation, but when I was the chief, I had a couple of shoulder surgeries, and I went out for the second one to Colorado Springs, and had a surgeon out there that I'd met and really liked do the surgery. He had done a surgery on Betty's shoulder when she was doing triathlons and stuff in years past. And so I screwed it up. I had a fall. I tore it up again. So I wanted to go back to the same surgeon. So we were going back to Colorado. Donna and Terry Sturd, who was my, my assistant there in the, in the Pentagon front office, and um, I think it was Heather Pringle had just come in as exec. 
And my guidance as I was walking out the door was, hey, boss, don't um, do any email while you're on Percocet this time. <laughs> which which kind of got my attention. And I said, what, why? Well, what's up with that? And he said, well, just, you know, don't worry about it. We just don't do that this, this year. And so I said, okay, I'll remember that. But as I was leaving, I saw on Terry's desk this box with an Apple iPhone in it. I've never had, never had a smartphone before. I had Blackberries for years and didn't really know how to use those. So I said, wow, is that for me? And I'm kind of kidding. She goes, actually it is. When you come back, we'll get you checked out on it. And I said, well, why can't I just take it with me? I'm going to be sitting in a chair most of the time. The first few days after surgery, I can learn about the phone. I can kind of see what it has. And so I got this lecture from Heather Pringle about, OK, so you can take the phone, but do not try and use the phone while you're on Percocet. So we go, I get the shoulder surgery. The day after surgery, we're sitting in the BOQ in Colorado Springs, and I'm relaxing on leave now. And Betty says, I'm going to go grab some chow at the <laughs> grocery store. And as she walks out the door, I said, hey, before you go, give me that phone. I'm going to take a look at it. I get the do not. Do, I said, I'm, I just want to look at the phone. I want to learn about it. I've never seen an iPhone up close and personal. So, so I get the thing. I get the instructions. And I start like, you know, looking at the buttons and the, the apps. And I have no idea what I'm doing. This is a real pig at a wristwatch kind of thing. And I, hit, I go to the email icon. I open it up. And there's my emails in there, which is, impresses me. So I open up the first one. And it's just a silly email, just a yes or no kind of thing. And I, so I hit reply, and then I notice on the bottom of the screen there's that little icon with a microphone. <laughs> so I hit the microphone, and, uh, and a, a thing comes up that's obviously a recording thing. So I say something in reply to this note, and it types it out exactly the way I said it. I'm thinking, wow. So I hit send. <laughs> and I'm thinking, dude, you got game. <laughs> So I do two or three more of these things, and I'm getting sleepy now. But the last one I did was a, an email from the Military Archdiocese uh, in Washington, D.C., from Archbishop Timothy Brolio's office. And it was an invitation for Betty and I to go to some event at the National Cathedral. And it was from his chief administrator, Sister Mary Catherine. And so I hit the microphone. I said, Sister Mary Catherine, uh, I'm on the road right now. I'll be back in the office next Monday. I'll get you a reply then. Appreciate it, Mark. And it? types everything out. I hit send, and I hit the snooze button, because I'm really good at that. The next day, I asked Betty for the phone again. She gives me the phone. I promise her I'm not going to do much. And I open it up, and there's new emails. And one's from Sister Mary Catherine. So I hit that one and open it up, and it says, the first line, thanks, sir, dot, 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 I think. <laughs> so I scroll down the email, and I start reading it. And it's exactly what I said. Until I get to the closing, and I realize that on the only email I've ever sent to a nun in my life, <laughs> instead of appreciate it, Mark, I close with eat shit, Mark. Betty was not happy with me. I think Donna probably called me and lectured me about doing email on because it not a great day for me. So me and me and IT, me and we're like this. What Miss did ask me to talk about though, this idea of success is kind of an interesting thing, interesting thing to me because not long ago I was looking just at photos for another presentation I was trying to figure out how to put together and I bumped into this thing. And one of the last things that Betty and I were blessed to do uh, when I was the Chief of Staff of the Air Force was travel to a conference in the UK with the Chief, of the, Royal Air, uh, the Chief of Staff of the Royal Air Force. And at the end of that, he invited me to make a trip up to RAF Coningsby to the Battle of Britain flight there and to take a flight in the Dakota that they have in the Battle of Britain flight. Now, the Army Air Forces in World War II called this a C-47, as did the United States Air Force later. But what was cool about the Dakota to me was my dad flew these out of England in World War II. He had actually he towed a glider on D-Day with one of these. He resupplied Patton's Third Army breakout from the Bocage country after D-Day in their race across France. He was part of the Christmas airdrops in the Battle of the Bulge. So, and then eventually, in Operation Varsity, the largest <laughs> glider assault in history, he was towed by one of these on his one and only glider sortie as the Allies crossed the Rhine River into Germany for the first time near the town of Basel. 
So this had a lot of significance to me personally, and I got to take a flight with this great, great, great young guy who's a Eurofighter, typhoon pilot by day, and flies to Dakota on weekends at air shows for the British population. One of the cool things about this flight we took, though, was that he had done a lot of research on my dad, more than I had. And so as we took off, he said, we're going to uh, this airfield, which is where your father was stationed in World War II. And I said, really? I didn't know that. And he goes, yep. He was in the, you know, he gave me the number of the troop support squadron, a troop transport squadron he was part of. He said, Here's what, here was their flying schedule on those days. He said, he took off on D-Day at this time, and we're going to go fly the profile. So he got an approval from all the right people to go fly a low approach over what is now a farmer's field, the former airfield my dad had taken off from. We went down very low and then climbed back up. And he flew the profile that those gliders flew all the way to the, the coast of the English Channel. And showed me how they had to fly at 100 feet initially, pulling a glider because they, they couldn't get the airplane any higher because of the fuel load and the weight of the glider behind them. And they'd stuff the gliders to carry as much as they could. Showed me how they stair-stepped their altitudes up as they approached the coast. Talked as we approached the coast about the line of ships going from the UK to the beaches at Normandy that morning and how all the anti-aircraft balloons were strung above them so that the glider pilots were having to dodge them because they couldn't climb over them all. I hadn't thought about all that. And then we turned around at the coast and flew back and he, on the way back we talked about, you know, we had talked about the adrenaline, the fear, all that on the, that they must have been feeling when they were flying. On the way back we talked about, okay, the adrenaline's now leaving. They're probably exhausted. They've been gearing up for this for weeks. They're, and they're wondering what's next. Because now we're in it. And we came back, flew another low approach back to the field as if we were landing, and then we climbed and came back to Coningsby. And one of the incredible things about that experience is you're going to think I'm crazy, but I could feel my dad in that airplane. Yep. He was there. Pictures, people, events, they remind you of things. They're how we learn. They're how, we're, they're how we're reminded of things we've learned. And as I was getting out of that airplane that day, my brain was in 1961. And I was going home and seeing, waiting for Dad to get home from work. This is how I remember him then. I don't remember him anymore old and gray, struggling with cancer. I remember him like this, young, fired up, already the veteran of two wars as a captain, World War II in Korea. He'd already flown that glider mission. He'd already done all that C-47 stuff. He'd already fought with the Army after he landed and he thought for the first time, how do I get home when somebody handed him a rifle? And he fought for five months with the infantry across northern Germany his Air Force Appreciation Tour, as he called it. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing guy. My dad ended up flying and fighting in three wars. For the fighter pilots out there, he retired with a little over 9,000 flying hours. 8,000 of those were in fighters. 19 different airplanes. He wore the Silver Star. He wore five Distinguished Flying Crosses. He was nominated for the Medal of Honor in Vietnam. He flew with the forerunner of the Thunderbirds, a group called the Acrojets in Germany. He was an amazing guy, an amazing professional, a phenomenal fighter pilot and professional in our Air Force, but more importantly, he was the, the world's greatest dad and the world's greatest friend, just the best guy you've ever met. And so I used to talk to him when I was younger about stuff, and I would talk about things like success. How do you get there? When I was at the Air Force Academy, I was home on leave one time. Dad was the wing commander at Shaw Air Force Base at the time. And I asked him, hey, how do you define success? How do I de define success? You know, what should I be thinking about here? I'm trying to mature and grow up a little bit. And he said this. I thought it was kind of a quick dodge. But I realized after talking with him a little bit that this is actually a great question. And the only hint he would give me at the right answer was that there's priorities. There's personal priorities and there's professional priorities. you got to figure them out. And it took me a little bit of time. It took me meeting this beautiful lady, getting married, starting a family, being a few years into my professional career to realize that these things do compete. 
And the tendency is always to lean toward the professional side because people are watching you there. Wrong way to lean, in my mind. And I came to understand that my personal priorities, faith, family, etc., had a higher weight to me than my professional ones did. But it didn't mean I ignored the professional ones. It didn't mean I didn't take them on. It didn't mean that oath didn't mean anything anymore. It just meant that whenever possible, I needed to remind myself and my family that they were the priority. Finally, that made sense. So here's how I define it now. On the day I die, when I'm lying on my deathbed, and I'm trying to decide whether I won or lost the game of life, the fact that I was chief of staff of the Air Force will be cool. The fact that I served for 40 years is something I'll be proud of. The fact that I knew you is something I celebrate. But none of those things are part of the equation. It's really simple. If Betty is standing there by that bed holding my hand, I won. When you're defining success for yourself, think about your priorities. Keep them in balance. Talk to yourself about what they should be. Only you can decide. And they're a little bit different for everybody. But this is not an easy question. I went on to ask Dad this question. I, I said, Dad, you know, how do I go about being great at what I do? How do I become a great pilot? That's what I wanted to do. You're a great pilot. How do I get to be that? And Dad gave me the dad speak again. He said this. And this one really threw me a curve. I, I didn't have any idea how to answer this one. So I just punted it for a long time, years, until I was a brand new flight commander in an A-10 squadron at RAF Woodbridge in England. And the night before my first meeting with my flight members, I was trying to figure out, what am I going to say to them? I don't want to sound too corny, but I, you know, I want to sound cool, but professional. And you guys have been through this. Your first flight chief meeting, your first flight commander meeting, your first supervisor meeting, it, 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 you're kind of struggling. You want to get it right. And I thought to myself during the middle of this kind of contemplation, boy, it'd sure be nice to be able to tell them like, who I am and what I stand for and what I won't stand for. Sure be nice if I'd answered that question before now. And so I sat up that night thinking I'd have this whole list of things, and actually, here's what I came up with. And this is what I told my flight the next day. I believe in the corny things. I believe in faith and family. I believe in pride and patriotism. I believe in loyalty and honor and respect. I believe in brother and sisterhood. I believe in courage. I believe in our flag. I believe in you. In our business, honesty is life. You don't tell the truth about a missing tool. You don't tell your flight lead your radar's not working. People can die. And they have. You don't give people honest performance feedback. Someday they end up in positions where they can't make decisions under pressure and people get hurt or die. It happens. For us, honesty is life. Honor isn't a code, it's a way of life. Everybody matters. Everybody on your team is critically important. Critically important to what you do, and they deserve to be treated that way. I believe we own our world, however big or small that world is. And in my world, diversity matters, inclusions an imperative. Diversity is a strength. Everybody better have a voice or I'm screwing up. Everybody should feel valued. I control that world. Nobody else can tell me I'm wrong. I might not be able to control your world all day long, but you can. Make it a great place to live and work. I believe if you haven't laughed at yourself lately, everybody else probably has. So take an honest look in the mirror occasionally, and please don't take yourself too seriously. You're really not all that. 
everybody who has ever worked for you is better than you at something. Most of them you're better, or better, most of them are better than you at a number of things, and some of them are better than you at everything. <laughs> kind of scary sometimes to think about that. Actually, it's an unbelievable toolkit you've been handed. Think about the perspectives you have on problems now and the tools you have to, to solve them and the solution sets you can come up with that you never would have dreamed up on your own. This is a thrilling thing to understand if you're a leader. And finally, for me, bring your A game or don't bother coming. I don't care how good you are. I figured out really early in my career that I was never gonna be the best at anything. Literally anything. But I could try as hard as anybody else. And I found that people respected that. I love grinders. I love people who come to work to go to work. When it gets really ugly, they're still there. They don't get emotional, they don't get fired up, they just get down to business. Because I know when you come out, there are really thick clouds on the other side and your engine's spitting oil and the scarf's getting a little tighter on your neck that you may have a little oil on your goggles, but your wingmen are gonna be there. Formation might not look real pretty, but they're coming with me. So I told the folks that I work for that this is what I stand for. And by extension, I'm probably expecting some of that from you. I'll try not to judge you by my standards, but just so you know. One of the guys in that first flight commander meeting asked me a question and he said, uh, hey, what do, you, what do you expect from me, <laughs> from us? And I really hadn't thought through that one very well yet. So that night, I, I gave him a really, a really half-assed answer excuse the phrase, but I really did, gave him a bad answer, and then stopped and said, okay, that's a bad answer. Let me think about this, and I'll get back to you tomorrow. And so I did, and the next day, I talked to him again about this, and I said, here's what I expect from me day to day, and so therefore, I think it's fair that I expect this from you. Nothing cosmic on this list. I'm not that complicated. <clears throat> but these things are important in my view. And since that night before my first flight commander meeting, I've relooked these things a hundred times. And I've never changed anything on either slide. Everybody who's ever worked for me has heard what I stand for. They hear my expectations brief, and here's what I expect from you. We talk about it. I translate it into the scenario of wherever we are, whatever we're doing, whatever their role is. Nobody's had a problem with any of these things. And the wonderful thing for me in my career has been everywhere I've been, people are this. This is how they acted. You gotta figure out what you expect from people. If you wanna lead, that's where it starts. And start with that expectation of yourself. But this idea of sitting down and thinking about what it is you stand for, kind of a simple idea, it took me years to figure out what Dad was talking about. If you're young in this audience, do it now. You'll be talking about it 40 years from now. The second thing Mitch asked me to talk about is, hey, what do you do to kind of improve yourself as a leader? How do you, how do, you do that over time? What are the things that you can suggest to us that we do to become better leaders over time? First, understand that there is no expert in leadership. Uh, nobody in this front row, certainly not me, know any more about leadership than anybody in the audience does. We might have seen more good and bad examples, but we don't really know anything more about it than you do. We've screwed it up more, because we've had more time to do it. But everybody in this room has an opinion on this topic. Everybody thinks they know what works and what doesn't, and you should all be part of this conversation. That's what I love about this idea of AETC talk. Let's talk. Let's discuss things that matter. Let's give our views to each other. I believe leadership is about inspiration. I saw this picture not too long ago, probably a couple years ago for the first time, and I threw it in my picture file, and then I was going through looking for something else, and I saw this, and I went, whoa, I'm seven years old again. And I'm standing with my dad on the flight line at England Air Force Base in Louisiana as the United States Air Force Thunderbirds <laughs> <laughs> roared overhead in their F-100s.
And I thought instantly, I want to be one of them. In fact, I want to be the front airplane. They inspired me. They still inspire me when I see them. But every time I see a picture of the Thunderbirds, or when I see a picture like this, I'm back in 1961. And I remember that feeling. And it re-energizes me. And it makes me want to lead. Everybody has this in your past. <laughs> you all have this experience. To me, learning about leadership is about tapping into that and realizing that it's all there. You've seen all the lessons. You've been inspired. And it's happening all day, every day, all around you. Sometimes we just don't notice. Let me talk to you and give you some examples of things I do notice. And the reason I think this is important, by the way, and the reason I think that that experience in 1961 was important for me is I believe that becoming a better leader starts with wanting to lead. It's one of those sports, like every other sport, where if you don't play, you can't win. And the Thunderbirds always kind of give me that flip, you know, flip of the switch and says, OK, get out there and try it again. Yesterday was bad. It'll be better today. I was going through a speaker's uh, listing for my college, looking for people to come talk. And I saw this picture. And I went, I know that face. The name next to it was Balavia, David Balavia. Anybody know of him? He's a former Army Staff Sergeant. David Balavia was a member of the 2nd Battalion, 2nd Infantry Regiment in Fallujah in 2004. He was awarded the Silver Star for hand-to-hand -hand combat inside a house during that assault. That was a really horrible time for the US military because of the fighting was World War I and II level hand-to-hand -hand in the city. I mean, it looked like World War II Europe. His book is called House to House. It's a remarkable book. And when I saw his face in this advertisement for the Speakers Bureau that he is part of, I instantly remembered reading that book, and I thought immediately about one story in it, the story of Chaplain Eric Brown, who's the guy on the left. Chaplain Brown was the regimental chaplain, and he spent a lot of time out with the soldiers. They all knew him. And the day before the assault began into Fallujah, you may not remember this, but there was a Marine Corps regiment going in side by side with an Army regiment. The Marine Corps story is told in a book called No True Glory, written by a correspondent named Bing West. And the Army side of the story is covered by Staff Sergeant David Balavia. It is a grunt level, gritty view of infantry combat. And if you want to see something and understand something about that culture, read this book. There's nothing pretty about it. But he describes the night before the battle when Chaplain Brown was walking around praying with everybody. And when he came to Sergeant Balavia, Sergeant Balavia said, I can't pray with you. You don't want to pray with me. I've done things that God will never forgive me for. And Chaplain Brown said, let's pray. The next day as the fighting started, the executive officer from their company was an infantry fighting vehicle that was going through the streets when they were ambushed. He was wounded horribly. He fell back inside the back of the infantry fighting vehicle. The soldiers who were back there as the battle continued around him tried to save his life, but he was grievously wounded. And he bled out in the back of that vehicle. And when the attack was suppressed and they had time, they went back to a collection area, they opened the back of the vehicle, and they took the lieutenant's body out. Claude NCO turned to a young sergeant standing there and said, hey, we've got to get back out there, clean out the back of the vehicle. And in the book, Sergeant Blavi describes the rest of the squad sitting across the street watching this poor sergeant lean against the back bumper of the vehicle, looking in, trying to build his strength to do this job. And as he started to stand up to begin, he felt a hand on his shoulder, and somebody softly pulled him away from the vehicle. And Chaplain Brown said, let me do that for you. And he joined the rest of the squad on the other side of the street for 30 minutes as Rick Brown cleaned out the back of that vehicle. And then they did what soldiers do. They buttoned up, got back in it, and headed back to the fight with the chaplain, Eric Brown, walking right behind him.
Sergeant Balabi in the book offered this assessment <laughs> of Rick Brown. Chaplain Eric Brown serves because he believes he's been called to serve by a higher authority. The soldiers he served may or may not believe in that higher authority, but they believed in Rick Brown. They didn't have to go back to headquarters to find him. He was right behind them. All they had to do was reach out, and he was there. When I saw that picture of David Balavi, it brought me back to that story, and I was reminded that I was inspired by Chaplain Eric Brown. And that story taught me the lesson that leadership is never about you. It's always about the people you lead and the mission you've been given. Easy decisions, hard decisions, it doesn't matter. It's never about you. I was in College Station, Texas. I was asked to speak at a Veterans Day thing this year, and I went over to the Veterans Park, the a committee had built there. It's really pretty cool. They've got 18 different sites that they've put out in this main big city park called Veterans Park. And they're putting memorials at each site, each for one of the 18 wars that the United States has officially been involved in over time. So every war the country's been in, they are building a display. About half of them are now complete, and they're different. They're very cool displays. They have a sculptor who's a very interesting guy, sees the world a little bit differently, and it's really a very moving place. And as I was walking down the sidewalk, I realized there's actually a 19th display. There's one for the War of Texas Independence, which is only appropriate here in the Republic. And this is the sculptor for that. It's called Come and Take It. And it's a fighter, a Texan, part of the kind of the Texas militia in those days, post Alamo. And one of the striking things about that is if you're standing there in front of him and you look at this, you can't really see because the shadow of the hat, his eyes are, have been alerted. You can tell that something got his attention. And this is the angle I had when I walked up to him and I went, that is incredible. He, he's been standing there holding his rifle and now he's doing this. You, you can see it in him. And then I noticed his right hand going behind his back and I thought, what is that? He hadn't even moved his weapon, but his right hand has gone back. When you go behind him and you see his right hand is pulling his bowie knife out of the scabbard. It's about halfway out. I saw this picture and it was 1965. I was 11 years old. We'd just come back from five years living in England with, with dad and mom and my four sisters at the time. And we were visiting my grandparents in Corpus Christi, Texas. And they woke us up one morning and dad said, okay, get geared up, we're jumping in the car, we're gonna go see the Alamo, which none of us kids had ever seen. So my, that was my first day visiting the Alamo. And I learned the story of the Alamo, I learned the story about the Texas Freedom Fighters, I, and of course I learned about Jim Bowie. And his story fascinated me. Brought his group of fighters into the Alamo just because he thought it was the right thing to do. Stayed there even though he and the commander didn't get along at all because it was the right thing to do. And he never ran from a fight. Famous for that big knife he carried. You can just see the handle of it in this picture, painting. You guys remember the story, or at least the legend, that how he got sick when the fighting, the serious part of the fighting started. He had pneumonia. He had to spend the last couple of days of the siege of the Alamo in a cot in a little storage area behind the front wall. The last morning before the final assault by the Mexican army, the commander came down to talk to him, thanked him for staying, because they hadn't got along very well at all, but he was the first one to cross the line and lead his men across it when Travis drew that line in the dirt and said, who's, who's with me? He thanked him for making that decision. He checked his rifle to make sure it was loaded and laying by the side of his cot. He checked the two pistols that he always kept on the little stand by the table. And then he arranged the knife at Bowie's request so he could reach it if needed. Final assault happens. The defenders of the Alamo are all killed or executed. And basically, the Mexican attackers now have one person left alive. And they show up at the door of this shed. The only story that's been relayed is from somebody in the Mexican army 
who says they approached the door. As soon as he saw him, he fired his rifle into the first person through the door. He emptied both pistols into the next two. Then he reached for that knife. I don't know what really happened in the Alamo. Nobody does. The only thing we're sure of is when they found the body, he had an unbelievable number of bullet and bayonet wounds in it. And I read in the museum at the library that day when I was 11 that when they told his mom, Reza Bowie, that her son had died, and they told her about the number of wounds in his body, she said this, which I think is the greatest mom quote <laughs> in history. <laughs> The Alamo, Jim Bowie inspired me. And every time I see a picture of the Alamo or I drive by or I see a picture of Jim Bowie, I'm reminded that he taught me that while it's great to talk about leadership and study it, in fact, it's critically important we do that, actually being a leader is not about talk. It's about action. Really important leadership lesson, and it came out of a museum. 2011, I was a commander of U.S. Air Forces Europe. The Young Security Forces team was moving to the AOR. They started the deployment from Lake and Heath. They flew commercial air into Frankfurt International Airport, hopping on a bus to drive to Ramstein to get on a C-17 to go down range. As they loaded their gear on the bus in front of the, uh, front of the airport at Ramstein, all the guys were on board except for the last guy. A guy named Nick Alden. Nick was picking up the last bag when a young man who was obviously deranged walked up behind him, put a gun behind his head, and killed him. <coughs> Nobody on the bus heard the shots in the commotion of the airport. The shooter then stepped up to the bus, walked up the two steps, put the gun against the side of the head of Airman First Class Zach Cuddyback, a transportation journeyman out of Ramstein Air Base and fired, killing him instantly. He then turned and he just started firing down the length of the bus. Grievously wounded the squad leader and one other member of the team. The deputy squad leader, this guy, named Trevor Brewer, anybody here know him? I think he's still serving. Last time I saw him, he was a mine otter, Malmstrom, I can't remember which. He's a great Air Force defender. Trevor was a young assistant squad NCO. He was tucking his gear under his seat, and all this happened so fast that all those shots had been fired before he even raised his head up. He was sitting toward the front of the bus to the gunman's right, and when he looked up, he was staring the guy right in the eye. And the guy smiled at him about this far away, raised the gun, and pulled the trigger. And the gun jammed. He pulled it again, the gun stayed jammed. The gunman turned and ran off the bus. Now, I know, I'm pretty confident I know what I would do if I was Trevor Brewer next. <laughs> I wouldn't probably have done what he did. He jumped up from his seat. He directed the team to start self aid and buddy care on the two wounded uh, airmen. And he ran off the bus after this guy. Because he knew instantly that if the guy got into the terminal, he was gone. And he started screaming as loud as he could for the police. He chased him through a large portion of the airport a terminal at Frankfurt before police finally responded to this activity. He ran backwards up an escal a downward escalator chasing the guy. The guy got to the top, realized Trevor was gaining ground, pulled a knife, and turned to wait for him. And Trevor's bracing himself for the, for the attack as he reached the top of this escalator when two German policemen came from the side with weapons drawn and arrested the guy. When I met Trevor, I told him that he inspired me. And over the next couple of days, as we had him, he and the rest of the team at Ramstein trying to help him get through the aftermath of this ordeal, I was in awe of the way he shepherded this young team of security forces professionals through the aftermath of the most tragic thing they'd ever seen. Trevor reminded me that for leaders, you have to do what needs to be done. 
regardless of the consequences. That guy could have had another gun. He could have turned on him quicker with a knife. He could have had an accomplice. What Trevor knew had to happen is that he had to be brought to justice. I got a lot of time for this guy. I'd love to follow him. This picture was taken in 1920 in France. It's a little kid named Richard Chervesky, who was a chess genius. He's playing, all these different boards are being handled by chess masters from Europe. And he's playing them all simultaneously. Pretty amazing. He beat them all, by the way. I saw this picture and I went, 2000, United States Air Force Academy. Airman First Class Carissa Cetus. Anybody know Carissa? Everybody meet her back in the day? I don't know if Carissa's still in or not. I lost track. She, I know she was married and has a different last name now. She worked in the Commandant's Office, which is what the job I was at at the time at the Air Force Academy. And I'd been asked to speak at the Wharton Business School. And the, and the topic was, what do your people need from you as their leader? I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to talk to them about. And I made a comment to Carissa, OK, Carissa, what do you need from me <laughs> as your leader? And she got very serious about it. I was kind of kidding. She wasn't. She said, can I think about that for a little bit? <laughs> so obviously, I wasn't doing too well for her at that point in time. <laughs> and I said, sure you can. So she went off and thought about this. And then she came back, and we sat down, and we talked through her ideas. Now, these are maybe my words. All of this is her thinking. These are the notes I took in that meeting. Oh, just read through these. If you're talking leadership, this is gold. She was 19 years old. So who should learn from who in this leadership discussion? Carissa inspired me that day. And she reminded me that if you want to learn how to lead, you have to learn from everybody, everyone. Or you're kidding yourself. Somebody's got to recognize this place. This is the uh, dining facility of Bagram. Depending on what era you were there in, it might look a little different. I love the turkeys. So obviously it was Thanksgiving some year. I love this photo. I saw this in a newspaper article. And I love the photo because as soon as I saw it, I went, whoa, Mohammed McMedovich. <laughs> I was at the DFAC in Bagram when I was the commander of US Air Forces Europe. I went as, my, as the NATO air commander for my first trip there. And my aide de camp and I walked in and we sat down at a table with two airmen, just young airmen we didn't know. And we started talking to them. And the guy sitting right next to me turned out to be this guy, Mohammed Medovich. He was from the 19th Airlift Wing at Little Rock. He was a transportation journeyman. He was a pallet guy. He packed pallets. So I'm asking him how he likes that. And he said, oh, I like it a lot. And, Anyway, by the time we got to, you know, too much ice cream at the end of the meal, I said, so where are you from? Well, he's from the Balkans. He's from a place that back in the Balkans conflict in 1995, his Muslim family members were being annihilated. He was six years old at the time. Soldiers from the opposing forces showed up at his door one day. The first family member to go to the door happened to be a male and was shot in place. His dad grabbed him, his little brother, and they ran out the back door. His mom and his sisters were not treated very well, but they managed to join them in the mountains later. For the next six years, they hid, they ran, they survived. 80% of his family and extended family was killed. I didn't get any, you know, my ice cream melted, which is really a big deal for me. <laughs> I was fascinated by this guy's story. And even more fascinated when I said, how did you end up here? And he said, well, when I was 12, 
my family was able to get connected to a program that allowed refugees essentially to come to the States. And we competed, uh, we were selected, and I came to the US. I learned English, I went to school, and as soon as I could, I enlisted in the United States Air Force. And I said, why did you enlist? He said, because the United States Air Force saved my life. They saved my family members who managed to survive. The airdrops in the mountains by Air Force C-130s are what kept us alive. He said, for six years, I owe the United States of America everything. His dream was to go on to become a C-130 pilot and then meet the people whose lives he affected. Chow Hall guy. He inspired me. Every time I see a C-130, I think of Muhammad. And it reminded me that every airman has a story. They're remarkable stories. Some are really inspirational, some are sad, but they're unique. Everybody in this room has one. If you want to lead better, learn the stories. I took this picture at the uh, George H.W. Bush Presidential Library in College Station, building right next to the one I work in. I don't know if anybody's been here, but this is called the Kuwaiti Gate. There's a, a, a tradition in, in the country of Kuwait that if you give someone the key to your home, he's your friend for life. If you give someone your gate or the door to your home, they're part of your family. So the Kuwaitis gave President Bush this gate after the Iraqis were kicked out. It's a beautiful display. You don't get the full effect of this here because the, the picture didn't work well through the plexiglass. But if you look at the gate on the sides of that case are the names of every American who was killed during that conflict. They're listed by state. And right here is New Hampshire. And there's only one name there. It's Michael Chinberg. I was an F-16 squadron commander during the t that time. The squadron was stationed at Hill. Mike was in my squadron. He had stayed behind when we first deployed because he had not completed his mission checkout yet. He was new to the squadron and the wing. And he was getting married. So the squadron said, hey, stay home. Finish your checkout. If we need you later, we'll call you. We're just going to go over there and fly around for a while. We're not going to do anything. Nobody really thought we were going to war. And so Mike did that. He came, got qualified. He got married to April, got his honeymoon in. And then he called me in November and said, hey, I'm ready to go. And I said, Mike, you know, we really don't need you. you know, keep flying, do great stuff. We'll be back soon. And then about two weeks later, we realized maybe we were going to do something. And we had a couple of people get sick, and we had to send them home. And I needed another wingman. So I called Mike and said, get on over here. So he did. And we tried to spin him up as fast as we could. We'd done a lot of night flying, so we threw him into a bunch of night flying. And about three days before the war actually started in January, Mike was trying to rejoin on his flight lead, and we think he got a light on the ground confused with his flight lead's rotating beacon or something. We're not real sure. All we know is that he hit the ground, 60 degrees nose low, inverted, and full afterburner, going about 700 miles an hour. I'm pretty sure he died relaxed which wasn't real comforting to his mom and dad, Pete and Ellen Chinberg, when I called them a couple of days later after they finally found some remains in the bottom of that hole in the desert, 9,000 miles from home. Or to his new wife, April, when I called her. Now, you wouldn't have been surprised at all by their reaction to this news. I wasn't. I was shocked by my reaction to it. It wasn't the fact that somebody died. I've been around death my whole career. My, growing up in a fighter pilot community as a young kid, in, back in the day, people died all the time. I lived at RAF Weathersfield on a street called Cannon Circle. During the time we were there, five of the 11 families around the circle lost their fathers. It's a dangerous business. I'd never been in a squadron up till that point in my career where somebody hadn't died in an airplane accident while I was there. The difference was, Mike was my guy. I was supposed to be leading him. I'm the one who certified him as mission ready. I'm the one who brought him over because I was convinced he was ready to go. I walked out to the airplane that night with him. 
I was flying that night too, not in his formation, but my airplane was parked right next to his, so we walked out the airplane together. What did I not see in his eyes that would have led me to tell him, you're not flying? Or hearing his voice? What didn't I catch in his training program that would have kept me from certifying him? His death was my fault. That's how I saw it. It's still how I see it. You know, when Mike first left to come to the desert, I actually had never met his new wife. I'd never met April. But I called her and introduced myself over the phone and apologized that we had to pull him away. And I said, don't worry, April. I'll bring him home safe. That's how I finished the call. I lied to her. I've never talked to her since. She wasn't interested in talking to me. Mike's enthusiasm, his energy, his commitment, his patriotism all inspired me. His story reminds me that leadership hurts sometimes. It hurts bone deep sometimes. While I was chief of staff of the Air Force, that's how many airmen died. When I first took the job, I started a little Rolodex in the desk, and the Donna and the rest of the folks in the office would write the name of any airman who died, and the date, and then what the cause of death was. And I, I was thinking at the beginning, I guess it would be a Rolodex box. It ended up being six. And every one of them just ripped my guts apart. They weren't all things we could control. I mean, there was combat and training accidents and disease and car accidents and life. But maybe there was something we could have done different. And maybe made that number 2,161. That would have been a victory. That's what leadership is. One last comment about that last slide. Sometimes when you try and lead people, it's, it hurts, it's frustrating, it's difficult, it can be maddening. And there's somebody in this audience thinking right now, you know, I've had enough of it, I'm not putting up with that crap anymore. And I would ask you to reconsider. Mike taught me that leadership hurts, but I should lead anyway, because it matters. Everybody in this room deserves a leader who cares. And for the others in this room, that can be you. So six pictures that I randomly bumped into, six leadership lessons I was reminded of. They're pretty good stuff. I don't remember these all the time. I forget them, and then I see a picture again. So if you want to be part of this discussion and this debate, if you want to sit around a table and talk about leadership or any other topic, look for the inspiration that kind of moves you. You have people around you every day who do remarkable things, who say remarkable things, who care about each other. Sometimes it's in a big public arena, sometimes it's really, really quiet. Notice them first. Write down the lesson they taught you. Remember the moment. And I promise you, over time, you'll start to see the same things I do. And they'll move you. You'll be back in the moment. You'll feel the feeling like it was the first time. And you'll remember the lesson. And then you can share it with the people around you. I bumped into this picture. I'll show you one last picture and then one last slide. 
again, just looking for something else, I saw this. This is in 2013. Betty and I were the co-grand marshals of the Cheyenne Frontier Days Rodeo. Really cool, since me and horses, you know, we're like this. They're like me and technology. <laughs> <laughs> Betty's really good with horses. They like to bite me, kick me, run me into things. We both know who's in charge. This picture, though, reminded me of a number of things. First is that my wife's a babe. <laughs> Second is that for 41 years or so now, I've watched her lead airmen and families. I've never known anyone with more integrity. I've never known anyone with a greater sense of service, a dedication to excellence. My wife inspires me every day, and she reminds me of two things. One is that selfless is a gigantic word. Living up to it's a gigantic task. Find a role model. And the second thing she reminds me of every day is that if you really want to learn about leadership, start at home. There's lots of stories there, too. One last dad quote. You'd love my dad. I just asked him, well, tell me how the Air Force shaped you, Dad, to kind of become the man you are today. He was probably, he was out of the Air Force by this time, so he'd served for 35 years in the Army Air Corps and the Air Force. And he bristled a little bit, which is not normal for him, and he goes, Mark? <laughs> If you want something to talk about in your small groups, talk about this. What does that quote mean? And why is it such an incredible gift to the Air Force and to the nation that people like my dad and people in this room feel this way? Have that conversation. Thank you for what you do. Thanks for the sacrifices you and your families make each and every day and the ones you're going to make in the future. Thanks especially for having Betty and I here today. It's a privilege for us. We miss you. Take care of each other. Thank you.